Polling shows that many Americans in each party are uneasy about the prospects of a peaceful transfer of power in future elections, with half the country expecting there will be violence from the side that loses. Manipulated by lies. Our polling also shows that three in four Americans see the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border as either a crisis or a very serious situation. That 45% is a notable increase. Hey. Both of those issues, democracy and immigration, are dominating the campaign trail as we head into the last week before the first votes in the 2024 election are taken in Iowa. But first, we traveled to Eagle Pass, Texas last week and caught up with House Speaker Mike Johnson. We have a humanitarian catastrophe here and, of course, huge national security concerns. What we saw is, in, in some ways, difficult to describe, just the magnitude of the chaos here. Uh, the number of lives that are adversely affected, the um, you know minor children that are being trafficked into the country, and the fentanyl uh, mm -hmm. overdoses and poisoning that has uh, been a scourge on the country. And these are transnational, dangerous criminal mm -hmm. organizations. And the maddening thing about it is that the White House is allowing all this. These are policy choices that, that created this chaos. And it is thus policy choices that could change it. His first day in office, President Biden came in and issued executive orders that began this chaos. Um, Remain in Mexico is, is one of them. Uh, the, the catch and release program has created part of this problem. You could end catch and release. Bye. But I'll, I'll quote to you the, the deputy chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. He said, it is as if we're trying to administer an open fire hydrant. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't need more buckets. I need for the I need the flow to be turned off. And the way you do that is with policy changes. We're just asking the White House to mm -hmm. apply common sense, and they, they seem to be completely uninterested in doing so. Say, I'm going to get you the money. Please stop the flow. Are you saying you wouldn't authorize new funding? Right. The, I think anyone with common sense would tell you that you cannot throw more money at a bad system. We don't want to empower more of this. They, the White House, the administration, Secretary Mayorkas, have put a welcome mat out. Hey. In a triage situation, you have to stop the flow first before you can uh, commence with the uh, with the surgery. And okay. we, we're hemorrhaging here, and everyone knows it. <laughs> We've been asking uh, Alexander, uh, Secretary Mayorkas since he took office to enforce the law, to do his job, and he's done exactly the opposite. He's but, testified un untruthfully but, but why before Congress focus repeatedly. I believe Secretary Mayorkas is an abject failure, but it's not because of incompetence. I believe he has done this intentionally. I think these are intentional policy decisions that he's made, and I think there must be accountability for that. Se Secretary Mayorkas is not a good faith negotiating partner. He is unwilling to enforce existing federal law. Why would we believe that he would do uh, any new provision? He's lied to Congress repeatedly. He's lied to me personally, About under what? oath. He s stood in front of my committee on multiple occasions and insisted that the border is closed and secure when everyone in America knows it's not true. Hey. Provisions of H.R. 2 mm -hmm. include uh, reforming that broken parole system, reforming the broken asylum process. Uh, there's a lot who understand why those provisions are important. And the reason is, if you only reform one of those five provisions, if you don't end catch and release as a policy, if you don't reinstitute remain in Mexico, if you only fix asylum or parole and not these other things, then you don't solve the problem. You don't stem uh, the, the, the flow here. And again, that's the number one objective so that we can get a handle on this crisis. Do you believe that more border funding is needed? It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. They have to solve the crisis here and throwing more money at the broken system will not do that. All it will But you're not empower. opposing funding. That's what I'm trying to clarify. No, but we ha no, we, we understand that Border Patrol needs the necessary resources to do its job, but they can't do the job that they're hired to do unless you change the policy here. But hey. Federal spending must be addressed in a, in a very serious and sober manner. We, we crossed an important threshold this week, 30, th $34 trillion in federal debt. It's, there's never been anything of that magnitude in the history of the country, and it's not sustainable. Ah! The, the Congress has a responsibility. We have the power of the purse, of course, mm -hmm. and, and we have to be good stewards of precious taxpayer resources. We, we cannot continue to borrow money to spend it. And so reducing non-defense discretionary spending must be a priority of Congress, and we're trying to insist upon that in these negotiations. President Trump is, is trying to advance his, his America first priority, and I think that makes sense to a lot of people. The, the, the current president, President Biden, wants additional supplemental spending on national security, but he denies the most important point of our own national security, and that is our own border. And so the White House declined our invitation to have Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas join us today. <laughs> Aid to Ukraine is being held up in Congress by Republicans. People remembering this is an 80% issue with the American people. They yeah. understand the necessity of what we're talking about. We have to insist upon securing our own country. 
and also if we get the necessary information and uh, the necessary answers with regard to what what is the end game in Ukraine and how will be we be responsible with the, the expenditure of those resources. The, the White House has not given us the necessary information. The, the legal brief known as the Texas amicus brief, mm -hmm. um, challenging the 2020 election outcome in a number of states, which by CBS editorial standards makes you an election denier. That's so, nonsense. Well, that's, can I get you on the record on that? I've like, always you, been consistent on the record. Did you read the brief? Did you get a chance to read what we filed with the Supreme Court? Well, I, <laughs> read commentary about the brief, but not what we submitted to the court. But right? you what I, The argument that we presented to the court, which is our only avenue to do so, was that the Constitution was clearly violated in the 2020 election. It's Article 2, Section 1, and anyone can Google it and read it for themselves. The, the system mm -hmm. by which you choose electors to elect the President of the United States uh, must be done by the individual states, and it, the system must be ratified by the state legislatures. That is language, plain so language out of the Constitution have issues. The Constitution was violated in the run-up to the 2020 election. Not, not always in bad faith, but in, in the aftermath of COVID, many states changed their election laws in ways that violated that plain language. That's just a fact. I, I don't January spend 6th. much time responding to Liz Cheney's criticism these days. Liz Cheney worked with the Democrats um, uh, on the Jan 6, uh, January 6th uh, uh, Select Committee. <laughs> I'm telling you that the plain language of the Constitution has never changed. And what happened in many states by changing the election laws without ratification by the state legislatures is a violation of the Constitution. That's a, that's a plain fact that no one can dispute. This is water under the bridge. I mean, when, when the Supreme Court uh, it passed on the Texas litigation and did not address the issue, I believe in the rule of law. This is our system. We move forward. I, I, I work with President Biden as the President of the United States. I think that he will be a one-term president. but. Um, <laughs> You know, this discussion about what happened in 2020 is, uh, is yesterday's news. In the previous ad administration, uh, we were very critical of the House Democrats because they politicized impeachment. That is not the way that we should handle that heavy power of the House. Um, we do have a responsibility, however, to investigate uh, things that are untoward, and this has happened with the Biden administration mm -hmm. very methodically, very carefully, in a way that is exactly the opposite of what the House Democrats did during the Trump administration. And now the investigation is being impeded. The White House has suddenly uh, refused to turn over documents that have been requested and certain witnesses that are key to unwinding exactly what happened. So it came to a certain point that the House had to uh, pass the impeachment inquiry as a measure because that puts us at the apex of our constitutional authority because we'll have to enforce these subpoenas in a court of law. That was a necessary step that we had to take. So again, we, it's still not been prejudged. We've not made a determination that impeachment is uh, going to happen here. No, we, you can't prejudge an impeachment inquiry or investigation. I think that would be a violation of our duty under the Constitution. You have to investigate and involve mm -hmm. the truth where it leads. There is a lot of smoke here, and mm -hmm. uh, Congress has a responsibility to find the fire if it exists, and that's what they're doing right now, if very, very carefully. Let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. I agree. <laughs> and I've loved kids jumping on my lap.